Tonight, we look at HK's infantry automatic rifle, we pick up a hitchhiker, and we drive the wrong direction. It's all happening now on the 1911 Syndicate. The last time we were with HK, this happened. And now we're back and we're heading to HK's gray room to check out some of their most iconic guns. So stick around, Bubba. In route. Get them chicken biscuits. I haven't had a chicken biscuit since uh, Chick-fil-A back in Salt Lake City. Reigning world champions. <laughs> Stupid. Are they really the champions if there's no competition? Oh, <laughs> you guys are dumb. They're not open on Sundays, you bitch. Is that what they call themselves? Like Jangles Life? The Jangles. The Jangles. <laughs> she can't seem to get away from the homeless. Is that a hitchhiker? Who is that? Pull, pull up next to her. Are you kidding me? What right the now? hell? Well, hey there, boys. What are you doing here? Hey, I heard you guys were heading to the Gray Room. I thought I might convince you to stay a while here in North Carolina. What? What's in North Carolina? Oh, we got some fun. In the early 2000s, the United States Marine Corps was beginning to discover some of the downsides of the light machine gun. And HK being HK said, why don't you let us take a crack at solving some of your mission-related needs? Some might even say an impossible mission. The HK M27 has its roots in the early 2000s. For decades, the Marine Corps relied heavily on the M249 saw. While the saw provides a heavy volume of fire, it comes at the cost of weight and mobility. The M27, an infantry automatic rifle, was a magazine-fed select fire alternative. It increased accuracy and mobility, all while giving the end user familiar M4 controls. Its short stroke piston system also improved reliability and led to a cleaner, cooler gun. Factor in the ability to throw on an 11 inch recon weapons kit for CQB needs and HK wins the contract in 2009. And that's all great. But we didn't come all this way not to shoot. Special thanks to the sponsor of today's video. That would be Jeremy's Razors, a razor right here. Because I say amongst the things in life that do not need to be woke would be shaving. Or not shaving for that matter. Not shaving. We don't need to be bad guys because we want to have beards and, and be know, men. And buy razors from like-minded folks. They're cool. Founded yep. by the Daily Wires guys. Basically, they uh, Harry's Razors used to run ads on their podcast and they uh, shut those ads down due to values misalignment. That is oh. an actual quote. Cool. Um, and therefore they started Jeremy's Razors to there give beard care, facial care, razor blades to dudes like us, probably dudes like you if you're watching this channel. 
Even styling cards, if you need some direction yes. on that. Me and Chris clearly do not have uh, a lot of time currently on razor blades. But yeah. again, you know what you can do? You can brush that bad boy out. Brush that bad boy out, right? Thanks, Jake. You got the balm, you got the oils, you got the cleanser, the beard shampoo, all that kind of stuff. This bad boy, tungsten. Tungsten. You know? I'm not saying to you, I, I mean like... I haven't used one in a decade, but that? That, I mean, that is there, nice. There's a heft to it. So anyway, we will have a uh, promo code linked down in the video description. You guys can check that out. We like supporting companies that support us and our culture and community, and they do Bounce. that. So check them out. Appreciate the support. Get your shave on. Welcome, everyone, to a brand new series from your boys and men here at the 1911 <laughs> Syndicate. Um, over the next couple months, we've got half a dozen different uh, videos on some pretty special HK firearms. Today, talking about the M27. We'll introduce our guests in just a moment. But we will be talking about the M27. Um, that is a Marine Corps contract gun that some of you are aware of, some of you probably not. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of the fielding process of the M27, why the Marine Corps was interested in it, and we will go through all of the kit and all that cool guy stuff. Along the way, we'll shoot some demos, we'll compete a little bit, and we'll see how it shakes out. Okay, everyone, before we start talking guns, uh, let's introduce some men that are with us on set today. One of the cool things is, without telling you all the different guns, we are gonna have various subject matter experts that will be joining us for the videos and talking about the guns upon which they are an expert. You have seen this handsome man before on the channel last year. And James, before I have you introduce yourself, don't think that me and Chris are not insulted by the fact that you decided to grow stubble before you showed up out here. He well, said he shaved this morning and that's already what I said. Right. I just have to keep you guys on your toes all Seriously. the time. Seriously. Yeah, sometimes we feel handsome and then you show up and it's just like, well, what a piece of shit we are. My mom tells me I'm handsome. So uh, James, why don't you give your, uh, sort of intro yourself. The audience probably largely knows you, but for those who don't. Yeah, uh, super excited to be back now for our second year <clears throat> of H&K focused videos and, and to be able to be brought on board uh, for H&K once again, to be the tour guide, I might say, uh, for this series. You guys know me, <clears throat> these guys are great friends. They didn't have to twist my arm too much to come back. Uh, my background, uh, Marine Corps officer, uh, and then on to, uh, to doing my own um, company stuff within the firearms industry and then getting to support H&K at every opportunity. To, well, at least to say your me. company, yeah. my God. Well, yeah, I, so I, I, I run a, so humble. a training in uh, armor service company focused on H&K weapons uh, called Tufel Shun Tactical. Um, so happy to- Just start uh, taking a to, guess on how you spell it. Yeah, don't, you'll, don't, you'll don't get there. Try. Horrible get marketing there. decision, but, uh, <laughs> but you know- that's, Can I take a that's stab at it? it? Yeah, go for it. T-E-U-F-U-L-S-H-U-N-D. Not even close. Yeah. Dang. No. I, you sounded confident. Good. You felt confident. It felt confident. good. It's, it's a lot confident. of letters though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. A lot it of seemed you confident. Did, you did better than you do with math, so I'm Oh, yeah. Impressed. I don't do math yeah. in public, so, you know. Yeah. Um, and then this subject matter. Matter. So, Robbie, introduce yourself for the folks at home. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for having me out. i uh, super excited to be here. My name's Robbie Reedsma, and I, uh, I'm the defense director for Heckler & Koch Defense here in the USA. Uh, retired Marine Corps infantry guy, um, 20 years or so, and... Uh, yeah, super excited to be here. So do you have to salute him when you guys hang out or how does that work? No. Yeah. No? no. Oh, okay. O only if I, like, I, I feel out of place here because I, I, I yeah, barely yeah. have anything That's going true. on. So, yeah. It's true. <laughs> no, but this has been a, a real joy for me because uh, Robbie specifically, as we will go through this video, has, has really intertwined himself with the M27. So I, I couldn't think about doing a video on the M27 without bringing Robbie, and it's great that H&K brings us on, on loan to us here, this, this, uh, this video. Okay, so M27 IAR. For us civilians, yeah. right? Big um, mouthful. Mouthful, and I go, okay, the M27, I understand that's what the gun is. What is the IAR? Sure, uh, IAR stands for Infantry Automatic Rifle, and for the Marine Corps, it really dates all the way back to World War I. Uh, the Marines enter the war, they're armed with bolt action, 30 caliber rifles. They need something to provide suppressive fires as they maneuver across no man's land. And the machine guns of the time were very heavy, cumbersome, fixed position type weapons. Uh, so they didn't have a solution. 
There were a couple of stopgap things that were initially presented that weren't really ideal, but at the end, very final days of World War I, we see the introduction of the Browning Automatic Rifle, or mm -hmm. BAR. Mm, yeah. And that really transforms Marine Corps tactics and even the squad formation uh, going through the interwar years and through World War II. It serves in through um, Korea, but then after Korea, now we go to 7.62 NATO caliber, we get the M14. Again, they try and create an IAR, but it never really um, kind of fills the, the niche that it, that it needs to. And then we very soon see the M16 and M16A1 take over. And there is no longer an IAR. Everything's full auto capable. The, the billet position within the squad still exists, but everybody just has the ability to fire full auto, so mm -hmm. it's kind of lost. And we come out of Vietnam, really led by the Army, looking at several studies of you know, post-World War II in Korea and Vietnam. We have Project Salvo, Project Niblick, and then, and then uh, the uh, SPEW project. And basically to summarize it in short term, the Army looked at, at all of these in, uh, engagements and had basically deduced that volume of fire was what was going to win the day for the soldier on the battlefield. So we needed to give them that better capability. And coming out of Vietnam, the Army starts looking at a light machine gun in that role, not an infantry automatic rifle. Light machine gun is generally a belt-fed weapon that fires from a bipod, has an exchangeable barrel, maybe has a tripod as well. It's generally a more cumbersome weapon, more for defensive type positions, less apt to offensive mobile engagement. offensive engagements. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you have a trade-off of weight um, mm -hmm. you know, and capability in those things. And the Army leads a program. They initially... Um, uh, finish that program and adopt uh, FN's Minami, which becomes the M249 saw. For the Marine Corps, at the same time in the beginning of the 80s, they had seen the programs the Army had done, but they didn't buy it. They didn't believe that volume of fire was the solution. They believed that training and leadership was what was really going to lead to success on the battlefield. Um, and so you saw that with the creation of the M16A2 service rifle. Now has a heavier barrel, it's got target type sights, they take away full auto capability, and they believe that is going to make more precision fires and, and lead to that. And they didn't want a light machine gun, but since the Army had adopted one, it was in the system, and there was no infantry mm. automatic rifle mm. equivalent, they took it on. And that really, for Marines like us, starting in that early 80s period, all the way through the M27's adoption, really became this this fighting point between Marines within the infantry on, should we have a light machine gun or should we have an infantry automatic rifle? Um, and we can see there's strengths and weaknesses for, for both, but we'll kind of break it down to explain the why um, the M27 became the real solution for the Marine Corps, uh, really once global war on terror kind of forced us in that direction. So what, yeah, because mm. cause when I think light machine gun and IAR, and we don't have a, a saw out here, but a, you know, shot saws, and obviously the M27. To me, they seem to fill different roles. Yeah, yeah. To a, to a large degree. So, yeah. Marine Corps is looking for what exactly during this era? Well, you needed that suppressive fire. You needed something to provide suppression and rapid fire to allow the rest of the fire team and the squad collectively to maneuver, mm -hmm. um, and that was the solution that they had on hand. The challenges they came with that is um, what we could quickly see was now you have a weapon, first of all, that is about twice as heavy mm -hmm. as uh, the M27. It now has drum magazines, um, you know, belt-fed links, 200 rounds that are cumbersome to carry on your belt kit. It's got a spare barrel that's in a bag that you have to exchange. Um, and it is, a other than the caliber, it shares no similarities to the M16 sure. that the rest of the Marines had. So it's a completely different weapon. Normally, within the Marine Corps, we have a different MOS for machine guns. You have an 0331 as a machine gunner, you have an 0311 for an infantryman. So the machine gunners hold another MOS. They get a lot of training. That's their bread and butter. They focus on that. But now you take a light machine gun and you put it in the 0311 MOS and there's a big training piece to it. And that became a consistent trend challenge for the Marine Corps. It's hard to imagine it 
where we are now, even some guys who may be watching this that are serving the Army and the Marine Corps recently, if you weren't in the service pre-9-11, uh, you don't realize how broke we were. Oh, really? Like, just did not have money for anything. And, and I'll give you an example of this. My first unit I checked into, super excited, motivated, marched right in to use the restroom. And there's no toilet paper in the restroom. And so I walk back and I find my company, Gunny, and I'm like, Gunny, what's going on? There's no toilet paper. And he says, hey, Lieutenant, we're broke. This is the Marine Corps. You got to bring your toilet Jesus. paper from home. So if you can imagine, we didn't have toilet paper. We certainly ammo. didn't have ammo. Yeah. Um, so huh. the, the ammunition that was required to train huh. was really yeah. challenging. Okay, so as we've mentioned, the real advantage of the M27 as an infantry automatic rifle versus the M249 saw as a light machine gun is its ability not just to deliver a volume of fire, but accurate volume of fire. For the people at home who want to be able to quantify that in some form, uh, we like to think about MOA. Um, the M249 saw at 100 yards is a 12 MOA um, gun. Well, that means you're a foot within your intended target at 100 yards that's really not that close to being on target. And now if you stretch that out to 200, 600 and so on, you can see that you're nowhere near impacting uh, the threat that you're trying to affect. I like how you put that. Yeah. And, and at 200, we'd be two feet. Correct. 303 yep. feet? Your math is on point. <laughs> but the M24, uh, M27 uh, infantry automatic rifle is a two MOA gun. So now we're talking about two inches at 100 yards much more accurate and that's what we're really wanting to be able to do as a fire team as a squad in the mobile uh, assault um, get much more confidence otherwise you're just creating a lot of noise and not keeping the enemy's head down but more effectively putting the enemy down mm. oh. there's another good one huh? okay yes indeed so keep in mind that that the automatic rifleman, his job is it's one, it's a lightweight rifle, and he's able to move with it. So as a fire team or a squad, he's moving with those guys. Everybody's pausing to stop to then move to a, a more advantageous position to assault the enemy with or attack the enemy. Um, with the M27, you're, you're putting down a three to five round burst, uh, a, a short high volume of fire at those most significant threats. It's trying to stop that assault. Okay. Uh, and that's that's all it is. You can get up. It's very mobile. It's easy to do, and and you have precision of a rifleman, but you also have the automatic fire uh, for a significant group of targets or a high threat person or whatever to get him out of the way real fast. Cool. Okay. So how do we demo that? Yeah. So we've got a couple targets set up out here every about 100 yards or so, uh, out to 500, and we're going to have you guys come in, get in the prone, and engage it in three to five round bursts, and you'll see how quick and effectively you can do that. Okay. And and it was already agreed upon. The winner gets the rifle. Okay, so we've all, Whoa, all come to terms. Now, hold on. <laughs> um, and uh, is that a yes? No, that was no. Oh, <laughs> damn. I we excited. didn't say no. I know. So I didn't I hear no. Hear so, <laughs> so all right, let's jam mags. Let's do it. Let's do it. <clears throat> all right. Going hot. All right, so we're gonna go for that hundred yard target first. Good. Move over to the two hundred. Good hits, very, very efficient, very fast. Any sense of my hit count? I counted five. It was actually pretty good. Okay. It started. You can yeah. see it start opening up at about 400 or oh, so. Oh yeah, 400. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I'm just gonna. But but you're still all right at that target though. Yeah. And you were just off to the right. His head's down yeah, for sure. All right, we're gonna start at that 100 yard target right in front of us. Three to five round burst. Solid hits. Move to the 200. Three to five round burst. Good. Good job. 
And to the 400. All hits. You hear that, Jake? All hits. I, I heard one hit. <laughs> I, I said hit on everything when you hit it. Okay, Rowing. Okay, so we had a contest, therefore there must be a winner. I feel very good about my performance. You feel very good about oh. your performance. You think you won like always? I said I feel... Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do. I think the numbers don't lie. So who won, James? Bobby? That'd be Robbie's question. He was behind well, the screen. Robbie. From, from behind, looking at what everybody did, both of you shot phenomenal with it. I mean, it was, they were spot on. Thank but, you. But the tighter group, the more amount of hits. Hey, hey, come to daddy. That's <laughs> just because he's standing closer to you. <laughs> is that it? It's literally is a path of least resistance. Yeah, he's well, standing sure. there. Yeah. I still won, so thanks. Yeah, well, the Germans are going to come find you and they're going to win. Well, they remember, have. I'm 98% German, so they actually probably would prefer that I win this instead of Germany. Send me an email. I'll give you his home address. <laughs> you go get him. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the M27 and as part of that movement, um, and we won't go very far, but we're going to have a thread out there, steel target, probably about 100 or so, 150 meters out. Uh, and you're going to move forward. We're going to hear the command threat, contact, whatever. You're going to engage that target with a three to five round burst as the automatic rifleman. And you're going to rush forward, do a little zig or zag in there, uh, drop down into a kneeling, engage that target with another two or three, three to five round burst, and then move forward again. And then drop down into the prone and same thing there okay. a couple of three to five round bursts that's how that guy's going to operate to take care of those threats that are out there and this is that mobility piece where instead of having a, a bigger larger heavier belt fed gun uh you're trying to maneuver with and get up and get in position you'll see how much faster this is okay cool so we're moving along all of a sudden contact okay and it dropped down into a knee Prone? Yep. Into the prone and three five round bird. Good job. Good to go. Easy. Easy movement. Too easy. Think I got like 10 hits. Good luck. 15? My man. See? Yeah, we got the we got the, the counter up there going on. Dude, you didn't have your ears in? <laughs> oh, oh they, no. they were in earlier. Oh. As soon as that I was like, you get ready to take it first, I was like, oh shit, here we go. <laughs> Well, I'm that's sorry, sucks. Robbie. Oh, no, you're good. Next time, call it out, dude. No, I'm already deaf, brother. It's what? all good. <laughs> all right, so we're going to move forward. Is in contact, and then we're just going to do it right from the standing, engage that threat. Right? Too easy. Right. <laughs> Drop down into a knee. And into the prone. Oh my god, did you hear the amount of steel? It's like fucking like choir bells out there going off. Shit. Also, how's this view? <laughs> I, I, I think this one is going to Jake. I, I, Jake's got it. I got the gun now. The gun's mine now. That, that gun is going back. Okay. Cool, let's just recap the ass whooping. That, um... Oh jeez. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's get your feedback. I know that was a very short course. We didn't go very far. But what was your, you know, take on how comfortable you felt with the M27? It's so this is going to sound like a dig, but you're going to get where I'm going with it. It, it's like running with a heavy AR versus something that's a saw. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's a beefy AR. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But Far very mobile. Yeah. yeah. Very mobile. It's like running with a gun that I'm familiar with running yeah. with. You didn't feel yeah. hindered. Is what I'm saying. No. No. Yeah. Okay. So. Now imagine that that weapon is twice as heavy and you've got drum belt fed um, cases here on your belt kit and you got a spare barrel on your back and you got a fire team 20 yards ahead of you yelling, hurry the hell up, we got to continue to get in the attack. How do you think you would feel at that point? I'm glad people of his size exist for that. <laughs> <laughs> Which 0321 guy usually is my size, right? Yes. Right? Not a lot, not a lot. No. You know, yes. But true, I mean, I mean, the argument though is I'd much rather maneuver with that than a saw. Even Absolutely. being built like a man instead of a female, I would much prefer that. Yeah, he's talking to you on, so. on that, James. Um, yeah. Throw in the fact that 
easy mag change, easy to clear a stoppage if you get one and you can keep in that fight. It takes you a second and a half, a couple seconds, and you're right back in the fight. Where if you have a, a, a belt fed machine gun, you're talking 13, 15 yep. seconds, and that's in daytime. That's yeah. not including that. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, so the man you arms is already going to shave a ton of time anyways because yeah. you're just standard AR, yep. right? Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Love it. So, so do, do I still get to take it home? So you, you had it on the last one, but this time, got to go over to Jake. Come to Papa. <laughs> Come to Papa. All right, I'll see you dudes tomorrow. <laughs> Guys, if you're looking for any ways to support the channel, we would love it. And don't think that we're not going to talk about the very, very special, very, I'm obsessed with it, A5 uh, CQB gun here. We will be talking about that. Um, but before we get into that, if you guys would uh, support us with real estate, that would be great. We're basically a nationwide real estate company. If you're into guns and shooting, mill, LE, stuff like that. If you're getting um, a uh, permanent change of station, right? Things like that. Yeah. We can help with all that. Just let us know. Send us an email through the site. We got Patreon. That's basically just a way to throw uh, cash at us like strippers, and we're throw fine it. with it. We're fine with it. We have no real like. I will. I'm willing. Let's see it to show you skin. even the red skivvies. If that if that gets three dollars and eighty cents from you a month, then hey, go ahead and send it. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. On with the video. Okay, so. Um, Next stage of the conversation. So how does this come into, uh, you, you know, being fielded and, you know, getting the contract and uh, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So the, um, so uh, as James uh, gave a good little history lesson there, the um, basically uh, around 2000 time frame, there was an urgent universal need statement that was put out. So basically the uh, the divisions, the individual units in the Marine Corps are saying, hey, we, we have a need for something. Um, they did some experimentation, some, some internal testing to come up with some various solutions or probabilities of what might work or might not work. And uh, so that works its way up through the process. Uh, it goes up to the division level, and then it goes up to the MEF level, and then it goes all the way up to headquarters Marine Corps, basically. Um, it gets analyzed every which way from Sunday. They look through this thing, and they say, okay, let's see what we got. Um, they'll, it's basically a kind of a triangle. So you got um, systems command, which actually does the buy-in. You got requirements that comes out with the actual requirements and the performance specifications and everything. And you got a testing agency. <clears throat> so all those three kind of work in conjunction and it, it's, it, you know, it's kind of set up like a, each one owns a piece and it's all a significant piece um, and they all have a mutual buy-in to that, so to speak. So it goes up through the process and, and basically once that need is validated, the, the specifications or the requirements to the system are figured out. They say, okay, let's move forward and funding gets put in place and then um, they, they put it out to industry. So it comes out to industry as a, uh, well, they start with market research uh, for sources sought, uh, what companies can deliver something oh, according to these requirements. So it's not really open for anyone. It's kind of like you've been selected to compete almost? No, so anybody could respond to it, okay. but obviously there's going to be a vetting process that happens. Okay. Um, so... It, uh, yeah, they put it off the industry and they say, hey, who has the capability or capacity or proven history experience sure. to make something like this that can do these things? Okay. And we, then, we've heard that before. Yeah. Like with the original 416 contract, yep. it was similar, right? Jason told us that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. same with uh, even with sniper rifles. My understanding yeah. is there's yeah. a very small list of companies that yeah. can fulfill a military yep. sniper rifle yep. contract. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it, all, it all works in that same process. Sometimes okay. it's bigger scale. Sometimes it's smaller scale. Same, same general process. So. Okay. Um, so they, uh, yeah, so it goes out to industry, there's market research, sources saw it, and eventually it comes down to, hey, we, we, we want a request for proposal. Um, and the, uh, the government says, hey, let's, let's see what you guys got. And um, so you have to meet certain criteria, obviously. Um, you, you put your proposals in, you get your samples and all that stuff. The government tells you what timelines everything's working on. Yeah. And obviously they, they want to weed that down. I mean, nobody wants sure. to manage 50, a hundred companies or whatever. Sure. So there, there's, there's some cutoff points mm -hmm. in there and it gets narrowed down to, you know, somewhere Pretty quick. between, yeah, somewhere yeah. between six and, you know, 10 usually or okay. give or take. So as long as there's three, it's usually good to go. Okay. And so what was, um, I guess on that requirements? You know, what, what are they saying? Hey, here's the things that we need you to check off. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's a laundry a ton. list. It's probably like hundreds of pages long. Oh, it, it's, well, yeah, what's, it's, the, it's what's the uh, so, basics Yeah, of so that. Uh, basically is it's uh, precision is one of those, reliability is one of those, your height, weight, length, size requirements, width is all one of them. 
Um, they, they, they define it however they need to, to define it to mm -hmm. meet their, their requirements. Okay. Um, so again, we, we propose, in this case, HK 416, which became the M27. Um, so we said, okay, we meet the, you know, the barrel length, the muzzle velocity, the precision, the this, that, the other, the automatic rates of fire, um, the overall size, the accessories that have to come with it. It's, it's all okay, they're good to go. So once you get through that part of it on paper, they also look at the company too. So what's your sure. work history? What's you track know, all record, this, you all track stuff. record? And are they, do they have the capability to actually right. do this stuff? Yeah. So moving forward, uh, eventually they whittle that down to about four or five companies. Um, and it be, you know, it's all competitive. So you provide your samples, uh, and they go through the test process within the service. Um, so they're beating them up, measuring, looking, shooting, you name it, dissecting them. Uh, every which way from Sunday, uh, again, they're doing the taxpayers their due justice to make sure that they're buying yeah. something that's going to hold yeah. up and be worthwhile with all that money. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's just say for, you know, again, total civilian, Chris knows a lot more about military <laughs> stuff than I do. I'm, I'm like uh, uber civilian. So what is, okay. So the, obviously the M27 or 460, whatever it was called at that point mm -hmm. gets submitted. So like, what would be the testing that that's going through? So from a, a testing standpoint, when these are going through the production cycle, um, the, the Marine Corps specifies, hey, we want all these things done to make sure they're good. So one of the things we do is we put them through a 15,000 round test every so many lots. Um, government will come in, they'll select one gun, and basically that gun is going through 600 round cycles of rapid fire and then uh, full auto burst, three to five rounds, you know, uh, every 10 or so seconds. Uh, so we're getting at least a minimum 30 rounds per minute sustained rate of fire. Okay. Uh, we do that for 15,000 rounds. Okay. So it, it's a lot, right? So the, uh, and there's a lot of ammo. Um, yeah. So we have, I think it's 500 magazines. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, that we use and they're all numbered. Um, they go through oh, that, wow. they go through 600 okay. round chunks where we're shooting alternate mags, one semi, one's auto, and then every I think it's 1,200 rounds somewhere in there. Uh, we'll pull it out and we'll do a, a basic cleaning like a user in a, in a, out in the field would do, and just a quick visual inspection, lube it up, put it back into the, into, into the fight. Every roughly 1,800, 2,000 rounds, however the numbers work out with the mags and all that stuff. Um, they shoot them for precision. Or we're shooting five five-round groups, um, and then they'll clean it again and, and actually inspect and gauge and all that stuff and put it back in. So 15,000 rounds later, we're shooting it again. So <laughs> to date, um, we've put well over, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many guns, but well over 90,000 rounds in just this testing, this 15,000 round testing through the guns. Um, and we've had probably maybe 15 stoppages. Huh. Um, so when you look at a, a mean rounds between stoppages on something like that, it's absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, from a precision standpoint, when you add up all those numbers and average them all out or whatever, the average is somewhere around like 1.7 minutes of angle uh, for a five-round group at 100 meters. Incredible. And that's with M855. So it's not the huh. most precision yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, and I'm going to take a educated guess of a theory here, which is part of the low rate of stoppages is because of the – short stroke piston system, the action is staying very clean mm -hmm. and cool, which we'll go ahead and show you a clip of. Mm. Okay, so how much fun was that? I mean, full auto is always fun. Yeah. Right? Pretty awesome. Okay, so you sent the bolt hole forward. Go ahead and hit that rear takedown pin. And pull that bolt group out. Put it in your hand. Hand it over to Jake. <laughs> now guys, did you burn your hand? Not at all. Yeah, yeah not at all. Not at all. On the face? Yeah. It's incredible. So wow. that's another advantage Next. of the M27 Ooh. is it's short stroke gas piston operating system does not impart any of the hot carbon fouling that you'd normally get from a direct impingement weapon like an M16 or M4. So the gun runs cooler and cleaner for longer, less wear on the internal components, much more reliable. It is Thank cool. You. And I have been aware that this is like, you know, a demo that exists. And there is almost a part of me that's like, really though, like. Is it I, that? I mean, that thing's total same temp as 
I mean, I, that'd probably the temperature changed on that yeah. BCG. I mean, that's, you know, pretty cool. Pretty Very cool. cool. It's a pretty cool thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Pretty neat. That gun was ran hard today. That mm -hmm. bolt is not very dirty right no. now. No, no. Like there's very little carbon that's blowing back into that system. And that's of course due to the, the piston system, yep. which is pretty damn neat. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great feature on a gun. Some people are all about pistons, some are not. Uh, and you know, hey, everything's got its little spot. But with having that piston up here, it is. It's keeping that bolt a lot cooler, a lot cleaner. Um, it adds a lot of reliability to the gun. So when we talk about, and this is a closed bolt system. So when we talk about having a potential for a cook off, um, mm -hmm. It's keeping that bolt cooler in here, Big time. Um, so that allows us to get higher sustain rates of fire with this system a com compared to a direct and a cook off for yeah, folks and a cook off. Well, no, no, for for folks that don't know what a cook off oh. is. So basically, uh, yeah, cook off is if you leave around in that chamber after you got done running that gun hard, and that chamber's hot, that round's going to get hot, that powder's going to get hot, and eventually that primer powder something's going to go boom, and and it's going to shoot a round yeah. out, and you don't want to be walking around with that gun when it goes through your foot or past somebody. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no doubt. So that's sure. a safety issue. So my my uh, research notes could could be off, but um, it from as best I could tell, it seems like the request came out around 05, HK wins the contract around 09. Yeah, kind of. So there there was um, so the that universal need statement hit. Uh, we'll say early two thousand somewhere around sure. there, um, and again they analyze it and look at it. Uh, around 2005, six time frame, they, uh, I think it was Office of Naval Research maybe said, hey, we, you know, let's see what industry has and we can pr provide prize money, so to speak, uh, for any neat designs or whatever. HK, I think, offered uh, the G36 maybe at that time. This mm. is all before I was there and it didn't get none. It wasn't innovative enough. It was already mm. in existence. It was already there. Um, around 2007, eight is when the actual request for proposal came right. out for the, okay. the whole competitive downslide. So uh, I think we, HK won it in 2009 timeframe, somewhere yeah. in there. Um, so it was, yeah, there's a, a bunch of pieces where the government's looking at stuff in between that and the actual award. Okay. okay. And so it, it uh, gets the contract. And so I guess the, the, the question becomes, so what is the for lack of a better way to put it, like, what is the adoption level of this? Like, how prominent is the M27 in the Marine Corps? Oh, it's well. So let me let me back up a little bit. Sure. So, um, so basically, we go through that down select process, and and again, they're testing everything from from vibration shock, all your mil spec testing, your tops manual stuff, to make sure it can do the heat and the cold. I mean, everything, right? They're they're looking at it with a fine tooth comb. Um, uh, end of the line, we, we won it. Um, there we, we got the award. And then there's a lot of meetings that take place to basically figure out the configuration. So once they test it, you're not sure. changing anything. Uh, you figure out the configuration, they agree to it, and they go through kind of a logistical piece on that. They do a factory tour. They're looking to make sure you have the capacity and they're checking that. All the quality that goes along within production, how we're testing it, hmm. how we need to test it to make sure we're meeting minimal acceptable levels for the government. Um, again, taxpayer dollars at work, and, and bottom line is, is some infantryman is going to have one of these, and you know everybody wants that thing to work in its yeah. worst possible moment. So there's a lot of effort that goes into it from from making sure it's good, and and then you start into production with it. Okay. Um, so we were producing. Um, so, uh, so all said and done, is uh, our first low rate initial production or low rate initial production? Yeah, L rip. Um, that actually happened, we delivered that on November 10th, 2010. So Marine Corps' birthday, 2010. Of course. Yeah, it was kind of neat the way it worked out. And uh, actually, we we're, were actually sitting in Germany at one of those meetings when, when the word came down like, hey, we're going to move into the LRIP phase. Um, so that's their first big batch of guns that they're going to get. They mm -hmm. go out to the units, and then they're going to do further evaluation around the world or whatever. So uh, the, the officer looked over at me from the Marine Corps, and he goes, you know what six months from right now is? And I was like, eh, somewhere in November. And he goes, yeah, November 10th. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So, yeah, sure than sure, anything. No way. Yeah, for, That's first cool. one, present to the Marine Corps on their birthday. First no five, way. 500 and something guns. That's very cool. 500. Um, so, yeah, so we delivered that. Those went out to a bunch of different uh, battalions and went through their new equipment training, uh, which is like James had said earlier, you got to set all that stuff up. Yep. Um, 
And then it went from there. And then eventually they're like, okay, this is proven its thing. This weapon system has proven itself out within the user groups, within the operational side of it. Um, and they get to a certain level of parts that are on hand and all that stuff. And they're like, okay, we can move forward again. So then we go into full rate production. Huh. Um, so when it gets into full rate production, now we're on a regular production cycle. So the delivery orders are getting issued um, and, and we're just going straight into production. Um, hmm. Once you go into that, again, well, all the way from the very first ones all the way up through full rate production, you have different levels of, of quality testing you have to do. So there's a design verification piece to it, which is usually a little bit more detailed. Um, and then it kind of whittles its way down as to make sure the government has high enough confidence it's in so how we're making it. And, so and interesting. I mean, everything you're saying, like oh, yeah. the, the it's, I mean, like the number. bureaucracy of, of it all is, oh, it, is yeah. pretty stunning, yeah. you know, like. Did we ever get anything? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're just like, ah. So one of the initial things that the Marine Corps is looking at, um, again, goes back to the requirement, is the automatic rifleman billet position, whatever you want to call it. One per fire team, and, and that's what where the M249 was located at, and this is, you know, they went forward for an automatic rifle for that guy. So one per fire team, and, and that's kind of the, the role of that gun in that, that position. Um, so the numbers initially were, uh, again, are not what they ended up being later, um, but they, yeah, they, they fulfilled that, that piece of it. And then to my understanding, there is an, an expansion, if you will, that happens somewhere in there. Yes, correct. Yep. So the, um, so when we get into full rate production testing, so it was a, a five-year contract. Um, so we, we delivered, uh, I think every one of the single guns that was in the maximum, maximum, uh, objective that they could actually purchase maximum <laughs> acquisition objective. And, um, uh, so contract ended, and again, they're using these things. There's a lot of experimentation uh, that the Marine Corps did with that. Um, Marine Corps prides themselves on marksmanship, and rightly so. Uh, and the gun's a really good shooting machine. Um, the, uh, so they realized that they could actually take this system, and going back to the old Mark 12 SPR uh, systems, um, 5.56 special purpose rifle, they... Uh, they could take the existing stuff that they had in the SPR program, and it was never truly a program or record. Um, so they could change out the optic on it. Um, they could add the suppressors that they already had. They could use the old uh, uh, variable powered optics that they had in place already from the older program and use better precision ammo. And it met all the requirements for the, met the previous requirements for that. So huh. you started to see more of a, a DM role start to come about with this system in the Marine Corps. And then the uh, the uh, Marine Corps said, "Hey, we're going to call that one the M38. Same exact gun, the way we delivered it. Uh, they're just changing out the accessories that are on it, and then the, you know, again the primary ammo for mm -hmm. it. And um, yeah, so it was kind of interesting to us because you had two different gun or one gun that could do two completely two roles. opposite roles from an automatic rifle role to a more of a, a DM type role yeah. uh, with one one base system. Well, and then the next section we'll wind up talking huh. about." almost a third variant, I would argue, of a now shorter variant yes. of this, right. which is really cool. So you guys should definitely stick around for that because it's not something you see every day. Um, but, okay, cool. Yeah, and then the success of, of that expansion leads to the core-wide adoption within the infantry and combat arms-related MOSs to replace the M16 and M4 with the M27. So now if you go to an infantry squad, it's, it's M27 pure across the board. Um, and that, That's awesome. that was fun for us. You know, when we were there, you get to see the Marines get their first time behind the gun. And after they, you know, give high fives and get so excited about it, if you ask them, what do you think? The, you know, the trend comment was always, why don't we all have this? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been great to see that original contract expand to, uh, to greater potential for the Marine Corps. So I was sitting out with uh, LAR at Camp Pendleton, and they're doing their new equipment training. And and the literally they go through a you know half day class, day class, whatever it is, on all their new equipment. Yeah. Right. So they yeah 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 classroom stuff, and then they get out to the range. And uh, those guys sitting down and shooting those first couple groups when they're zeroing up all their stuff and everything, they get up off the line and just 
ear to Grinning. ear grins, yeah. dude. You just know you made that Marine's day. You know, well, did it's they get like brand incredible. new ones? Yeah, brand new, dude. Yeah. That's yeah. a first brand for a lot new. of those Marines too, right? Lance, Lance Corporal getting up off the line with a brand new H and K gun, and he's shooting groups that are like he's never shot before in his life, and he's like, "Holy smokes, this is incredible! This is like the How best cool. day of my life." It was, it was a really, especially with your background. Yeah, yeah, fulfilling, very rewarding. Yeah, to actually see that whole process happen. That was yeah. neat. Instead of, you know, a clapped out M4 that has 40,000 rounds through it and it's yeah, like precisely. 24 MOA, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, precisely. <laughs> no. Okay, so sorry to keep you waiting, everyone, but let's finally actually really start getting into the gun and kit and all that kind of stuff that us gear nerds really like. So I guess first thing, how is this actually different than a 416? Because obviously it's got a different so, yeah. name, and there are tweaks, but it's yeah. like it's 416-ish, but not 416. Yep. So, uh, again, first test samples, we're all labeled HK416. So the M M27 is an HK416. The M27 name comes from 2-7, um, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, that actually came up with the whole concept oh. and tested it through in that initial stuff. So oh, interesting. it's kind okay. of a inside vote by the Marine Corps, and they said, hey, yeah, cool. what, what do you think about this? Well, absolutely. So that's, uh, oh, cool. so that's where it's got its name. But it's in okay. the, the the overarching thing is the, the infantry automatic rifle. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's how you get the name. So, and again, they were 416s. So what you see here on, on this gun on the table right now today, the, this upper receiver is actually one of the original test upper, or test oh, okay. guns, or from that test gun that we provided to the Marine Corps way back in 2007, eight, somewhere in oh, there. Oh, really? Yeah. So when they were being fielded, like, you're kind of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, the, like... This is it. Okay. Th this is literally it. How many rounds do you think are on that upper in particular? I mean, it's got to be a ton. I mean, it's a, gotta lot, be a ton. A lot. A lot. Yeah. And it's mostly many automatic. It, yeah, a lot of automatic yeah. fire. It's been yeah. rebarreled, I would assume, right? So this one, no. Um, oh, because uh, the only ones that we have this out in front with the bayonet lug, are going to be the M27s wow. and that barrel length with that thing on there. That's so that's the so OG your, barrel. That's OG, OG barrel, barrel and everything. Yep. Dude, and that's you can wild. see it's pretty well. It's I noticed the the yeah. discoloration yeah. on there. Yeah, it's, it's beat. Yeah, that's the on. charm. That's the charm. But there are some um, things that are different than a 416. Yes. So for the most part, again, it, it's a, a short stroke gas piston operated system. So just like the HK416, it is. Um, it's got a little bit longer, a two inch longer handguard um, on the front. It's accessorized with uh, what met the Marine Corps requirements. So your um, the flip up front and rear sights, and again, Marine Corps qualifies back to 500 yards. So these are more match precision type sights that are on it. So they mm -hmm. can do that with iron sights. Um, and these are knights sites. Yes, they're yep. And they're already armament. in the inventory, correct? Yes, and they're okay. so the Marine Corps. Well, they are. So the Marine Corps said, "Hey, look, we can use stuff we've already got. And we want to keep our training process the same. So, thus, we want these on cool. the gun." Um, so as as they changed over with them later, um, the uh, well, the initial batches were delivering both sites on it. Okay. Um, again, it's one less thing they got to change in their inventory. Later on, um, then when they started doing more stuff, all we had to do was provide the front sight okay. because they've already got the rear sight. So, yep, uh, uh, M16A2 or an M4 is going to have the A-frame, so therefore they would need that to go on this this setup. Um, it's got uh, the charging handle on the side is going to be a little bit extended. It's ambidextrous and reversible. So oh, it was, so it's reversible. Yes. So oh, it's uh, okay. so for all all the lefties right. out there, yeah, yeah, easy yeah. solution to switch that thing right over. Uh -huh. You're just knocking out a couple pins. The armor can do that. And okay. Switch it right over to the other easy side. Um, the um, and that was a updated feature at the time. Now it's 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 almost a standard thing that you can get anywhere. Bipods already in Marine Corps inventory inventory from your old stuff. But again, now they're getting more guns. They want new bipods with them, so that's easy. Uh, the sling and the sling rail adapter right here. They initially, it was a three-point sling at the time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then, obviously, we all know what we think about three-point slings. Right. Uh, right. Especially for rifles and good shooting, uh, marksmanship principles. So the um, um, Blue Force gear is what we submitted on that, uh, along with the Blue Force gear uh, uh, rail mount fixed loop up front. So it's, it's a very secure sling. It allows the Marine Corps to actually continue to do their qualifications out to 500 yard, put a loop sling on there, yeah. all the stuff that they normally did. Yep. Um, so again, good sling and yep, stuck with it. Uh, initially the magazines were, so on our, on our very first sample guns, um, they were HK416, the, the high reliability magazines, yeah. which worked great, but they are a little bit heavier and they're a little bit more expensive. Um, I think the decision was made amongst all the 
remaining competitors and the Marine Corps to say, hey, let's basically this gun's going to go out to the fleet, whichever one it ends up winning. So can we just use the same magazine across the board within Marine Corps inventory? And everybody said, yeah, sure, of course. So the um, so that's what it was tested with after a certain point. Later, um, just and again going into the reliability. So this one's got the uh, Magpul P Mag in there. Um, so later on, around 2018 time frame, uh, the Marine Corps did a 20,000 plus round test with three different ammo types, M27s, M4s, M16s, all that good stuff, and no failures. Uh, that, I mean, Jeez. they're like, we're adopting this right That's now. That's cool. Because yeah. it shaves, because we had someone explain the math to us once on a mm -hmm. combat loadout for an infantry yep. Marine. Oh, it saves a ton If of you weight. go from the metal mags to a P-mag, yep. you're shaving literally like two and a half pounds. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Which it's again, a lot of weight. makes a big difference, yep. Yep. right? Yep. So, very and, cool. and and we always look at a, at a magazine as a disposable item. Sure. So you don't want to spend a whole heck of a lot of money on a magazine, it's and you certainly behind, don't yeah. want it to weigh you down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yep. shave yeah. the weight yeah. and keep the reliability. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Uh, how about optics? Uh, optics wise, so the Marine Corps already had this is a the Trigicon. It's a three and a half power. Uh, Marine Corps calls it the Squad Day Optic. Um, so basically, this was already on their M249s, um, and the ballistics between the 16.3 inch barrel and the M249 were pretty close, so they could use the same reticle that's mm. in there already. Okay. So they just transitioned that right over. So okay. uh, Marine Corps, huh. again, we provided the gun with a lot of the accessories. Uh, Marine Corps provided the mags. Uh, they've just moved their optics over. So mm. depending on what phase of time we're in and where things went to, the Marine Corps actually said, hey, here you go. Um, they already had a lot of the Knight's Armament. Um, vertical foregrips. Vertical foregrips, mm. yep. The man rail covers was something that got added in in the beginning. Um, when you look at the, again, your, your heat requirements, so you're right. shooting all that full auto stuff and how hot do the handguard gets and what, yep. what can your temperatures be. Um, so this helps with that as far as where the shooter's gripping and anything that's black and metal in the sun in Iraq is going to get hot anyway. So it's really significant uh, heat reduction. And these pop off. Um, you can do your wire routing through those. So as you got your pack and all app hills and all that stuff on there, you can route that through and you know put it in your little pockets wherever you want. So it's your wire management is not getting snagged up on everything. Yeah, and typically these have a peck. Um, yes. We don't yeah. have a peck on this one, yeah. but... Um, they typically have a pack yep. and then um, suppressor. Yeah, so suppressor was never part of it. Um, uh, it, it again, going back 2007, nine time frame, suppressors weren't really in the mix a whole lot as far as big services go. Sure. Uh, later on though, the Marine Corps was one of the front runners and they said, hey, we're, we, we want to suppress everything in the infantry. Yeah. Um, phenomenal move. You talk about increase in survivability and it's just incredible. So, and with the right suppressor, it's gonna improve your marksmanship and all that other good stuff and give, keep that element of surprise in there. Um, so initially no suppressors. Later on, uh, Marine Corps already had the nice armament. Um, NT4. Uh, NT4 suppressors. I know where you're going with this. Yep. Because so they already had the muzzle devices in the Marine Corps. Yeah, they already so had they muzzle could just devices, use that. they already had suppressors. Yeah. And when we talk about M38 with, with the, 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 the designated marksman rifle of the squad, uh, same gun, they just took those same suppressors they already had and put them right on them and on. said, hey, we got a great system here at works. So it's, uh, it's an easy route to go and and it was good enough. And so, yeah, they, they went with it. It's They're a bomb-proof suppressor for bomb-proof yeah. gun. It's right? bomb-proof. Yeah. The, there's a degree of surprise for me just because that's, I wouldn't call that a low back pressure can. Um, yeah, I wouldn't either. But, and, uh, you know, and it's 20 plus years old, but again, it fit the requirement and the needs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I look at it this it's way. It's just like you, you, most four sixteens like the low back pressure stuff, but it's like, hey, yeah. Marines yeah. are rocking with a yeah. high back yeah. pressure can. It, it, it's doing good yeah. enough for them. Yeah. Um, and I, when you think about the Marine Corps and Marine Corps infantry, and you're going from no suppressed capability uh, on your weapon system yeah. to just having a suppressor sure. on your weapon sure. system, yeah. it's a step in the right direction. No I mean, doubt. It really truly is. Yeah. Then no it's doubt. got gate lock on it, so they can yep. dump it if they need to in an yep. extended firefight. Yep. That would make the most sense. Yep. Now that we put all the pieces together. So. Okay, so super cool guy stuff. I, I, I must admit, heading into the video, this was actually the thing that I was probably most excited about just because I have a, a recent MR556 and I'm like, ooh, I want to see the new, I want to see the new guy. So so break this down because some people are just like, hey, you know, what is this? Yep. So this, this is HK416A5. Um, it's got, this one has an 11 inch barrel and of course you can get multiple barrel lengths. 11 is going to be the shortest. Um, it's got a two stage adjustable gas block on it. 
Um, you're going to have an all ambidextrous lower receiver. Mm. So every one of your controls is ambi. And then you can have the ambi reversible on the charging handle again, just like it's on the M27 yeah. that we talked about. Um, or you can, you can do these upgrade things here and you get a dual. Um, the uh, depending on which way you want to go. This one obviously is in RAW 8000, mm. so it's going to be that German Army type uh, FDE color. Look, I have uh, a te yeah. technical question on that. Yeah. Why is it so cool? Because it just is. Because it just is? It just is. Just is. So, so when, when you take something and you sprinkle uh, ma magic black forest fairy dust on it, That's it automatically it. becomes cool. That's what the thing is. <laughs> I was going to say German magic on it. Yeah, there you go. It's like, I just need that gun in my life. Uh, and again, no. at the end of the day, I'm going to try to steal it. Okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. And you're going to have to figure out. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it's, it's a hard no for It's got to go home. Back yeah, to yeah, the yeah. office. There's not a lot of these in the U.S. Well, say these are not abundant no, within no, the country. Um, some of the other cool stuff on this. So adjustable gas block versus, but, you know, the built-in iron side, like, I don't know Recessed. why. I, I don't know why I think that's so cool, but I yeah. do. No, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a for, from a true backup iron sight standpoint. It's really great. That, people, like, they, they put too much effort into backup iron sights in sure. general, right? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm the same way. I come from that Marine Corps background. I'm like, oh, I want to be able to do everything out to 500 yards with my backup iron sights. Mm -hmm. But then do I ever use them? Click. No, I don't. <laughs> no. You know, the optics no. really don't fail a whole lot. So this, you see a lot of these in Europe, and it's actually a really good low-profile setup. It's very simple. Um, just just updating your stuff, you're going to pull it up just and rotate that around. Oh, it's going to change damn. your elevation in there, Jeez. and you got a little windage knob to adjust your windage. And then, as most of us do, once you put your optic on, okay, Slap those are zero, and you never look at them again. Yeah. Um, but there, it's a nice little setup. Um, and again, you can get the handguard with or without those things. Oh, can you? Because um, yeah. I was wondering, like, if you had an IR device, I'm like, this is really cool, but if you had a... Exactly. IR emitter, you're like, well, no. you just get you, know, you do have less space. Pick a tenny all the way out. Okay, yeah. well, that's cool. That's and then, cool. as you can see, it's also got the latest grip design, which we were talking no. about before. So, if you're familiar with the P30 or the VP9, now you have the ability to change your back straps and your side straps. Yeah. And there's a storage compartment in there with a multi tool that assists for all the work on it. So, the Germans have thought of everything. And, uh, Different um, trigger guard too. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah you got more of a winter trigger guard. It, yeah. It's elongated in there so you can get a gloved hand in. Huh. Your castle nut's gonna be longer as a base production one. Just again, you, you put all these accessories on here and drop it. That, that uh, It's just one of the strengthening points sure. to it. Like, hey, we're gonna make sure that never breaks on somebody. Um, and then your magazine well, uh, as you can see, is, yeah. is gonna be more flared like the M4 style. So going back to the HK416, um, when HK designed that gun, it was, it, we look at a 5.56 magazine, and of course we're going way back in time, um, but they took the SA-80 and what they learned from that program, which has got a longer magazine well also, mm -hmm. and they said, hey, when shooters are grabbing that magazine, and again, we're going back in time, older magazines, maybe not as well made and all that stuff, um, you get more more stoppages, higher rates of stoppages are burying the mag in the dirt and it's wiggling around in there a little bit. Yeah. So that's why we had that, what I would call more elongated magazine well. Um, well, now that modern technology is caught up, you got much better mags, much better ammo, this, that, the other. Shave H it HK finally said, okay, let's just shave this down so it works with everything out there. Cool, cool. Um, hmm. And then, so I guess, you know, maybe, maybe more of a broad strokes question, but like, the idea, uh, I'm going to make an assumption, you tell me where I'm off or, or, or correct, is that, hey, we take our base M27 lower, and now when we need to go from that IAR, kind of a DMR type capacity to, I An need, to, do, I need to do some CQB shorter range stuff, we take our same lower, and we now have our interchangeable upper. Yes. That's the idea? Yes, that's the idea. So yeah. so basically, we, we said, um, uh, so again, there's a number of things on that contract uh, for the Marine Corps. Um, so one of the things that we saw in, in recent times, and, and again, from, from HK, we've always kind of pushed that, hey, it's a modularity piece, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we, we do provide or have provided uh, reconnaissance units with this 11-inch package as part of that M27 contract. And so look, they man. can do just that. It's an arms rooms concept. So if, if you've got, if the, you know, they're doing a, a, a maritime raid somewhere and yeah. there's a direct hit in and out, uh, doing BBS or visit board search seizure, maritime interdiction operations, um, it, he can, the, 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 the Rakondo can basically say, this is the gun I need for that mission set. I'm in tight, confined spaces. We're good to go. Uh, easy huh. day. Uh, hey, we're going out into the 
into the woodlands and the you know the wildland and all that good stuff mm -hmm. and we'll put our longer one on there or you can do a mix and match hey yeah throw that in your bag yeah you're gonna be yeah. the dm you're gonna be the automatic rifleman and the other dudes are taking this so it's a mix and match arms room concept that gives them the capability to do a number of mission sets mm. by just simply changing Upper out lower. uppers and lowers that's pretty high speed stuff for the marine corps man yeah. oh yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, five, a5 yeah. uppers and i mean yeah. like geez what is going yeah. on over there yeah. So it's about damn time. Yeah. So same thing, but in black. And yeah, now it's referred to as the recon upper kit. Yeah. Re reconnaissance mm -hmm. weapons kit. I just, you know, why do I have such an unhealthy love for that? Uh, uh, like I, That just, gun right there is pretty cool. That really, really does it for me. Like really does it for me. And I'll say this. So, so obviously, because we get it, guys. You can't get anything thing for that matter or hardly that you're seeing on the video today so for those of you we have borderline a reputation of like thanks for showing us a bunch of unobtainium <laughs> shit and we're kind of guilty of it if we're being honest with ourselves so we get it we can't you can't get an m27 you can't get the recon upper kit what you can get is <clears throat> so you can get a um guns clear everyone so you you can get an mr556 and frankly the full length mr556 you can get pretty damn close to that M27. Yes. With a standard MR556. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so with a standard MR556, um, you just get the two inch longer handguard. You mm -hmm. wouldn't have a bayonet lug on the front. Yeah. Right. And you get the, the bigger stock, uh, the wider stock that yep. goes on that for better marksmanship shooting. Yep. And basically that is the same size as, as your M27 is. Right. I mean, it's it's that in a nutshell. Yeah, throw an ACOG and an yeah. RMR and yeah, a yeah, can, you and go. you're like, hey, you, you kind of yeah. got a good clone there. Yeah. Or if you wanted to go that direction. So we'll actually be talking about this gun um, in sort of the transformation process of doing an MR556 build, because this is meant to be like, you know, like a shorty 416 clone. Um, so you could actually, you could get close-ish to that, but you're gonna wind up in this bastard child territory in terms of like, look, you got some A5 parts and then some non-A5 stuff and everything, mm -hmm. but you can definitely do kind of a retro MR556, like 10.4 build, um, and they're pretty damn neat, so maybe tune in next week if you guys are into that. Or, or you could join the Marine Corps. Or you could join the Marine Corps. That is another option. Join the Marine Corps. It's good to you. Yep. And then there you go. I'm aged out, so that boat has sailed. But What? Yeah. I thought it was like Sorry. 18. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So any final thoughts on, uh, you know, the the guns program? Anything? No, it's for, I know for you guys, it's got to be a program that's so, close to home yes. being Marine Corps. So for, for HK, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding program. We're very happy to be able to provide that to the Marine Corps. Uh, very proud of it. Um, they've had a, a phenomenal success rate with, with all their guns that they have and everything that the guys are doing. So it, that has been really good to hear. Um, it, again, it's been good to them, and I'm proud to be a part of that, especially given my background. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I, and I look at it yeah, and think sorry. of it as being a massive success story for the Marine Corps to give the Marines what they want, what they need, and to find you know, ways to um, take care of the taxpayers' money. They did this in a way that saved overall money that otherwise would have gone to lengthy, you know, contracting, bidding processes to go out and do all these other things. And they've been able to do more with less, which is what the Marine Corps is all about. Yeah. And so when we get into the uh, logistics of this thing and your life cycle, mm -hmm. how long that gun lasts and the parts and all that mm -hmm. stuff, there's a life-saving cost. Uh, our taxpayer money when you look at how long those components and parts last as well or sure. the barrel last you sure. know it's yeah. so you're not having to upgrade and redo this thing all the time um like again going from 2010 to now uh, and and yeah the marine corps has saved the taxpayers us a lot of money in replacement parts and this that and the other just because of the reliability and the durability yeah. longevity of the system all right, so say you got in a legally justified self-defense scenario. Bad day. You're gonna, well, definitely a bad day, yes. but you're gonna want protection. Protection is important. That protection is firearms legal protection. <laughs> okay. You like that? Yeah, yeah you like that? It's a play on words. I got him on, I got him. Right, it's what, do, what do they words. offer you if you use their um, service? So it's like CCW insurance, even though it doesn't have to be limited to CCW, you might go, hey, I'm not a CCW guy, but I would like to protect my home in the event I get burglarized or something like that. Um, so if you're in a legally justified shooting, um, they will cover all of your attorney fees, all that good stuff. They have the crime scene incident. They got the hotline, so when you call. It's an actual attorney that you talk to, not yeah. a customer service rep. Because that ain't who I need in that moment. Nope. Um, so they have a few different tiers, whether you travel, if you have family, if you're like a bachelor just hitting the scene every night like me, um, they've got that plan. So the code's 1911, saves you guys like a third off the service there. Yep. Check it out. They're good dudes. Go give it a look.